How's it going, Terry? Hey, it's fantastic. How are you doing, Ryan? Doing good. Thank you so much for coming on the Life After Business podcast. I'm super pumped for our conversation today. Um, I'm very excited about it. Can't wait to, uh, to do this. So, you know, for our listeners' sake, you know, you and I had a lot of time last week at the Value Builder Summit to have some cocktails, swap some stories, and really get to know each other. And uh, really excited to dive into to your journey because it's a it's an exciting one. Um, for our listeners' sake, can you? Kind of give them a backdrop of the company that you owned and kind of how you got to where you are today. Sure. Uh, so I grew up in a little town of 600 people called Piron, Illinois. That's about 30 miles straight east of St. Louis, right off of Interstate 70. Uh, growing up, my family owned a wholesale fuel and lubricants company. So we delivered fuel to farmers, uh, trucking companies, excavating companies, manufacturers, and bulk lubricants, motor oils, hydraulic oils, and stuff like that. So uh, pretty humble beginnings. My dad bought the company and. 1975 so i grew up with it i came back to the family business in 1991 and kind of took it over um at that time when i came back it was just my mom and dad and myself and we had two trucks and i tell people it was a good day if they both started so <laughs> <laughs> uh and I, I came back for the purpose of the company was having some tough times uh, i knew if we we had been presented with an opportunity to buy another company i knew if we did that it'd put us back in the black so in 1992 the way it worked out i started my own company tri-county petroleum and uh bought that company and we merged my dad's company in into tri-county and over the period of at that i think our first year we was like seven hundred fifty thousand dollars a year in sales and um until i sold the company in 2010 had the opportunity to purchase 11 other oil companies and uh build a new bulk plant we uh, trademarked our own brand of private lubricants uh, during that time. And uh, when I sold the company, we was doing over $42 million a year in sales. So when I sold my company to Growmark Incorporated, which is a cooperative out of Bloomington, Illinois, uh, they actually operate nationwide. Um, so Growmark bought my lubricants division and eight of their FS member companies bought my fuel division. So actually sold the company to nine different companies, which was interesting. Wow. And, and and I'm really excited to kind of dive in because you told me some of the stories about how that, that final uh, acquisition, your eventual sale was. But I'm, I'm kind of just crazy curious because I mean, you went from two trucks to 42 million. So first, the, the, the first comment I'm curious of, why did you start your own company and then buy your parents? Uh, you know, it's it, my dad. So my dad's company back in the day, if you go back to the late 1980s and the early 1990s, that was about the end of the era where you had a two bay service station with full service gas and self service gas and everything was being converted to C stores. Well, my dad, you know, when he had the company, he had several stores uh, gas stations that he delivered to uh with a you know a 2000 gallon truck mom and pop stores you know dad was the mechanic mom ran the inside and uh those were all going away uh he himself had one of those stations and uh leaking underground tank bank said uh you know handshake deal back in those days uh believe, believe it or not this is a true story he closes his, his service station down to convert it to a c store shortly after he closed it down his banker committed suicide and the new banker came in and said well your sales have declined dramatically and we can't loan you the money so oh my, my dad gosh. was in a little bit of a financial pinch so if we bought if he bought the company that we was looking at which was bone oil company uh because of the ucc filings and stuff the bank would already automatically have control of the assets so i started tri-county petroleum and um um you know we went the other way that's so. genius i mean yeah that makes a ton of sense i mean so what was it like you know working with your parents at the beginning like that i mean i mean obviously if they were this kind of you know chugging along you know doing normal sales for like with a lifestyle business like it sounded like for quite a while and then you came and just blew the top off it all like how did the conversations go how did you guys figure out what you wanted to do well it was uh it started off slow you know and i and i'd worked in the business my whole life so me coming back really wasn't that big of a deal my dad and i have just very fortunate um we have always 
gotten along great together. I don't think we've ever had a crossword. Uh, my mom worked with the company, which is kind of funny. She was the one that kind of made me pull my hair out. She uh, <laughs> definitely a depression era. You know, from the depression era, I mean, she did things like use both sides of the adding machine tape and <laughs> said use both sides of the paper. It's like, oh, my God, Mom, you're killing me. <laughs> so, so, but, you know, we just did. So, I mean, that was in 1992. We bought that company and then uh, bought another company in 1995. And I bought another company in 1996, which was a funny story because uh, uh, in the process, the owner had a stroke and couldn't talk anymore. Oh, and no. uh, we took the company over in February, and in April, I finally tied the the uh, wife down. They was older. You know, I was like, I got to pay you something for this company. So we worked out a deal. But then, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, I. I don't remember all the dates but then in the year 2000 is when things really took off we bought three companies that year and it you know after that it was just there was something happening almost every year so, so it's exciting times that's a crazy amount of work i mean so you know for for everybody's insight what were the size of companies and first of all why what was with the acquisition strategy for growth versus just growing organically um so a, a major a lot of us most of the companies the purchase price was under five hundred thousand uh, dollars. I don't know if it's so much me being smart or being in the right place at the right time because a lot of the companies that we were buying was just people that was ready to retire and uh, they, they really didn't know what to do with the company. And here I am, young and dumb, and willing to take on all this stuff. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, it, it it was a learning process. A lot of the people contacted me in the beginning because uh, my insurance agent you know uh told them that i would might be interested uh towards the end i would i would call companies and just say hey you know they obviously knew who we was i called it planting the seed i just touch base with the owner and say if you ever want to do something or if there's a possibility of us working together you know let me know so that i mean that's even if they were all under 500 grand, I mean, you still blew the roof off it yourself and you, you, you had a process and some synergies and you had some stuff going that was a secret sauce outside of these acquisitions. So I want to hear a little bit more about that, but before you go into that, um, what were, what were some of the things that you were learning as you were buying these companies and like technically how you were structuring the deals? Like, was it cash purchases? Were you financing? Was it earn out? Kind of give me the rundown of how the spectrum, because with 11 acquisitions, I'm sure there was a little bit of everything. <laughs> it was like the MacGyver of, <laughs> of financing. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's tough. You know, probably the biggest thing was in the early days, you, you know, you, you, uh, the biggest hurdle in the early days was I needed the income from the company that I was buying to cash flow the loan that I was getting to purchase it. After the acquisition of a couple of companies, if you let's just say for argument's sake I'm buying a company for two hundred fifty thousand dollars and I'm gonna pay it off in five years. Mm -hmm. If the if the cash flow from my company would pay for that debt without taking into consideration any of the cash flow from the company that you're mm -hmm. buying that's when it became real easy and we could just really pop. But, you know, until we got there, I mean, the first company I bought was 100% owner financed. Uh, we gave the owner $10,000 cash at closing and uh, he financed it for five years. Uh, there was other companies that I bought that would be partial bank financing, partial debt uh, owner financing. I bought two companies uh, that were distressed. And I gave them 25% of the gross profit for one year. The one company that was a, the first one I did like that was uh, the fastest company I ever bought. Had the deal done in three days. Uh, <laughs> what? How did how did you uh, find the place and how did you get it done like that? One of the company's customers called us and asked if we would deliver fuel to them. And I'll give my mom credit. She asked why they was calling us, and the person said that they're the company they got their fuel from uh was closing the doors on friday and this was on wednesday so oh when i got gosh. back in the office my mom told me about it i gave the guy a call it turns out the owner had died willed the company to his niece and it was losing money so her brother was helping her and uh he said, I'm closing the doors on Friday. I said, what are you doing with your customers? He said, I'm telling them to go someplace else. I said, hold the phone. I'll be right there. <laughs> so oh I drove 30 minutes away, and, and you know, he had already told a number of customers to, to go someplace else, but we worked out a deal. I paid him cash rent for their bulk plant, and 
uh, we went around and uh, you know set the customers up or the customers for Nat Oil Company up as a salesman in our computer system. So at the end of the month, we just printed off a sales report, whatever the gross profit was, took it times twenty five percent, and wrote them a check. And it actually worked out to be a very fair deal. I bet you you were just a savior in their minds. Yeah, I mean, they went from literally shutting the company down and getting nothing for it mm -hmm. to, I think at the end of the day, if I remember correctly, um, I think they ended up getting $72,000 or something like that. So, I mean, that wasn't a bad shape. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. So, I think, you know, there's like this big, you know, black hole about how you can structure deals like this. And, you know, with, with your experience on both sides of the table and then also as an intermediary now is I, I'm kind of curious, like... How do you, where do you start? And I, and, and I had a guy on my podcast that he said, there's the purchase price or the, 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 the offer price. And then there's the terms and conditions. He's a really funny guy. And so how did you back into how you were going to be negotiating these deals? It's all about cash flow. So it's a, that's a very interesting question. So for me, it, you know, when you're buying a business like that, typically the bank doesn't want to give you a uh, a loan over five years so it had to be you know it had to work out to where i could make that loan payment you know and that debt service would cash flow so really to back up one second there's two sides to every to every loan you know in in the most simplest way cash flow and collateral so the the tough part about my business is i didn't have any good collateral i mean i had tons of gas tanks and bulk plants that would cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars to build new but the bank doesn't want that stuff as collateral but as far as cash flow i was a cash flow monster now you flip that around and look at a farmer you know he's got land he's got grain he's got cows you know all that stuff can be so readily sold it's great collateral but maybe he doesn't have the cash flow mm -hmm. so it's always a balance between cash flow and the collateral and we always fought the collateral but then it's interesting because if I could pay for the company in three to five years, that's generally where we would trigger a purchase price. Uh, after I sold my company to Growmark, which they have a whole acquisitions department, um, I got to know them pretty good, and I was like, "All right, what's your, you know, where, what's your trigger point?" And for them, it was three years. If they could get a thirty-three percent return on what they was buying, then they would pull the trigger. So, uh, you know, interesting after my almost 20 years of doing it you know they was looking at things very similarly so how did you you know so they with a huge acquisition team in a bigger company and we'll, again we'll dive that into them a little bit but you know they've, they've got very set metrics what was i mean did you have set metrics or were you just trying to get the deals done did you have a certain return uh for terms and for uh percent that you were looking for no, it was basically off the three years. So where me and my account, my accountant would always have some would butt heads is with me buying other oil companies and consolidating them into my company, I could save a significant amount of bottom line expenses. And insurance is was really usually one of the bigger ones because owning an oil company, most of the time your minimum liability coverage you have to have is – two to five million well i already had that so i mean you'd have a mm -hmm. little company but then they would be paying at least ten thousand dollars a year in insurance and you know by the time you you really analyze those bottom line expenses you know insurance you know a lot of the times the companies that we're buying were 100 percent in the area we already marketed in so i didn't need their truck so any of the truck expenses went away uh if the owner was running most of the company himself you know all of his uh seller's income went away so uh we just knocked out a lot of the bottom line expenses and then looking at the top line uh most of the people that we were buying out didn't do bulk oil um you know we just had stronger purchasing power so mm -hmm. that's so where my accountant and i butted heads is i would want to look at the end the cash flow from the company and how it's going to look under me and uh you know their argument in which i agree was always you don't pay for what you can do to the company you pay for what the company is doing right now so mm -hmm. uh so beyond that i also just kind of had a philosophy you know we're in farm country so i talk about farming a lot you know mm -hmm. a piece of farmland comes up for sale you, you, it may only be for sale once in a couple of generations mm -hmm. and you know if this oil company comes up for sale that has been in my area i know i've probably been talking to his customers and they won't switch because they've been doing business with the guy for over 20 years so if i bought his company 
I we had a record of showing that we'd keep 95% of the customers. So I didn't, you know, I really focused on the owner wanting to get out of the company happy and i really don't ever remember having any hardcore discussions on price typically the harder discussion uh price is one thing but it's the allocation of the assets that i remember uh really being some more difficult discussions than coming up with the actual purchase price of the company well and and I, um, it's interesting you brought that up because uh, i believe at the irish pub <laughs> you and i were chatting about um <laughs> Uh, it's a coffee shop, right? Right, right. Oh, yeah. I, I don't think you and I had any coffee there or at the right time of the day. <laughs> but uh, you were telling me this cool story, um, and, I, and I've mentioned it in some of my blogs and I believe in one of my other uh, episodes, is you were talking about the price versus allocations. And it was a stock versus asset sale and how you were kind of ar- architecting that. Um, do you want to kind of elaborate or kind of just give a brief overview? And again, we don't need to get like way technical on this, but just kind of the general philosophy of how you went about doing that. Yeah, so it's it's the difference between ordinary income and capital gains. You know, right now, I hope we don't have a CPA listening that wants to say <laughs> that's not exactly right. <laughs> but for the most part, capital gains tax is fifteen percent plus whatever your local tax is. Uh, state tax here in Illinois, it's three point seven five. Ordinary income, you know, you're receiving this lump sum of cash, which is uh, one either going to personally put you in a higher tax bracket, or if you've depreciated the assets of your company off to nothing, now it's ordinary income back to the to the company, and you know you're looking at forty percent. Or in the case of this stock sale, um, I was surprised that it was a C corp, which makes it worse yet, and uh, that rate is believe 39 percent federal and then illinois 10 percent state tax so literally half <laughs> they was going to get and, and that 50 percent applied to the capital gains and the ordinary income of the c corp so they was going to get taxed 50 percent basically on the purchase price of the company which meant they was going to have to bring a check to the table to sell their company that doesn't you sound know? like a good idea to me no so we uh the there was a little bit of frustration with their CPA. He finally engaged himself, and we came up with uh, – because my original idea was to sell the stock of the company for – or sell the company's assets for a dollar and then give a bonus to the two owners. Uh, at the end of the day, what we ended up doing was selling the stock of the company um, – for the purchase price then that money came to the owners as capital gains and uh it was the best situation as far as taxes go well i love it because that's where the terms and conditions go right i mean you're a deal maker too just like we're i mean i was born and bred in sales too where the whole goal is the dollar amount at the end of the day so however the rubik's cube falls into play like that that's how you gotta figure it out i mean you know it's just crazy that's why it's just you know i I told you I'm writing a book and I talk about it at length in the book about, you know, getting your team of advisors in place, you know, get your CPA on board, talk to a financial advisor. we got a company that we're working on selling right now um, that now I can't think of it naturally off the top of my head, but they did some creative tax stuff um, that it's saving them over a hundred grand in taxes, you know. Well, so that's amazing too because that's called collaboration. So, want as, as we kind of move into the the progression of your situation too, because I want to talk about your book and what you're doing now. But to get us to to that, explain. I mean, you you grew the the heck out of this company from two trucks to forty two million dollars. What was the triggering event? Why did you decide to step out and like w- kind of walk us through that whole dialogue in your head? So my, you know, my focus when well, always was to grow the company and sell it. I mean, uh, maybe it happened earlier than what I anticipated, but we grew such an amazing company. I mean, we covered 14 counties in southern Illinois, the St. Louis, and the St. Louis metropolitan area. Uh, had five petroleum storage bulk plants, three offices. Um, we did emergency fueling for like when there's an ice storm that would come through the area and or tornado and you know. Hundreds of thousands of people are out of power, and they bring in four or five hundred power, you know, electrical look, power companies. You know, their trucks, their tree trimmers. We went around at night and filled those. We did uh, hurricane storms down in the Gulf of Mexico, going in, working for AT and T, filling 
generators. I mean, the company grew to where it was a 24 seven company. I mean, it, it just, it was around the clock. Uh, and we did a lot of very unique things with fuel hedging and all kinds of stuff, but really, uh, the pain factor started to come in when fuels four thousand four dollars a gallon and you have 3000 local customers, it's not a lot of fun and it's very stressful. <laughs> you know, we had a $4 million line of credit and about a three and a half million dollar accounts receivable, uh, Back in those days, the suppliers were putting pressure on you. They wanted letters of credit because you know your your sale or sales at that time were over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a day. Uh, so I mean, you're just going through a lot of cash. That makes you a leveraged company, even though you're making a lot of money, uh, just because of the size of your uh, line of credit. And uh, it was it was a lot of stress. And uh, I said I compared it to owning a stick of dynamite in your hand all the time so <laughs> well uh, and you and you're dealing with gas too so that's probably not a good situation literally yeah you got <laughs> you know 15 some trucks driving around on the road and and uh, uh it was i i tell a story you know last year my son was a freshman and played football and we was at a freshman football game and you know there's not a lot of people at a freshman football game in southern illinois and i looked around in the stands and there was 10 of my former customers there so uh it just gets tiring you know you gotta have your game face on all the time yeah. so kind of getting towards the end i uh worked with a lady betsy bigsby out of weatherford texas she works strictly with privately held oil companies at least she did back in the day and uh i knew betsy well and she also does business valuations and cash flow coaching and stuff like that so i had her value my business and she came up with a number and it's like you know what um if 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 i can get that for it i'd be crazy not to sell it i started out with nothing and you know that's taken a lot of the chips off the table and and uh it would you know, ended up being a very good thing for my family. So, uh, Betsy also brokered company. So she ended up finding, uh, grow mark, uh, kind of in an odd way, but you know, you talk about selling businesses. So I told you I, I, that was my plan all along. So I feel like we did a lot of things, right? Uh, we had things, you know, we had reviewed financial statements. We had tank leases on all of our equipment out in the country and, uh, not patting my back, but to tell you how smooth it went from the time I signed a letter of intent with Growmark to the closing date was six weeks. Wow. You wow. can't do that unless everything's in place. Especially, well, especially at a company the size of yours. Um, yeah. kind of curious, a uh, uh, couple things to go back to Betsy is how did, how did she go about valuing your company? Just, well, and you've obviously had a lot of experience as you were buying these companies, but what were the, what were some of the ways that uh, the methodologies that you saw or used with her? Uh, boy, that's going back a, a lot of years. Um, I remember, you know, I'm a CVA certified valuation analyst and, uh, I think our company sold for a much higher multiple than you see, you know, definitely see smaller companies selling for, but, but it was a multiple think, of EBITDA is what you're kind of going. You yeah, it was a, yeah, it was a multiple to EBITDA, but I think, you know, the reason that multiple was higher is because in this business, you're very fortunate. You have a lot of recurring income. I mean, from, you know, farmers are going to farm every year. You know, ambulances are going to run every day, fire trucks, you know, your municipalities. You know, manufacturing and trucking kind of goes up and down depending on the economy. But for the most part... Uh, we had a strategic buyer that was buying our company. Uh, of course, I wasn't known when she did valuation, but um, she has the experience. And I think oil companies like ours in general sell for a higher multiple just because of the recurring income. So the recurring income is a theme that you and I are very aware of because of our value building certification and John Warlow and the, the Kool-Aid that we've drank and the businesses that we've run. What else besides, because, you know, there's, we all know the eight key drivers, again, like these, this is uh, uh, clear to you and I, but as you were building this to sell it, I mean, very consciously, like you've said, what else did you do to build value? Because, you know, obviously you were growing at a very high clip, which is a very important factor and you're making money, but there were some other things I think you had mentioned, uh, you had a private label of lubricant and what, what else besides just growing fast and having recurring revenue did you do intentionally or did you find benefited you after the fact? Uh, so the um, the private label lubricants was definitely something that helped. Uh, they still sell them today and it's a, uh, it's a 
it was a big thing that they picked up for me, so I'm kind of proud of that. Well, tell tell us the story the, about why, because it was a, it's a really cool deal how you invented it, right? Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, it's no different than cereal or you know other stuff, private label stuff. You can get cheaper, right? So I, you know, we sold branded lubricants and uh, and you can get unbranded stuff cheaper. So I was getting my grease from one person and my 10W30 from another person and my hydraulic oils from another person, and I'd go into one of my customers' shops and it's like there's four different colored drums and <laughs> you know. And then if you wanted to change, oil's pretty simple. I mean, it's like making a cookie. You put the ingredients in and and that's what it is. So people get hung up on switching from one brand to the other and it's really not that big of a deal as long as you're using good stuff. So instead of to to overcome those hurdles, created my own brand of lubricants, extreme lubricants. And we you know, everything was in our barrel, blue barrel with a white top. Uh, we had our, you know, we go to manufacturers. I had my own grease, uh, which I was pretty proud of. You know, it's red and had an ISO 220 base stock i think we made it a little bit thicker it was really great in the summer uh farmers and excavators loved it um you know we sold to car shops but everything was in our brand you know that was what was nice about it so, uh, so that that was a plus another thing is we just had our ducks in a row and i think that's what's awesome about bringing people through the value builder system, it does a lot of the things that, I don't know, unconsciously we already did. You know, having signed lease agreements on all the equipment we had in the country. So, you know, it's a crazy thing about this oil business. You supply a lot of customers with tanks and pumps. So when you buy them out, if you already own a tank and pump, it's difficult for them to switch because now somebody else has to buy that equipment for them. So it's kind of a hook. Mm -hmm. You know, so we had that that buttoned up. Um, I had three operations managers and an office manager and uh they pretty much ran the company i was the serial entrepreneur out buying other companies and you know developing the private label lubricants but they ran the company um that's funny i put in the book and and they was probably happier when i wasn't there to help them run the company so <laughs> <laughs> so that you know that was taken care of i could have done a step better i did have non-compete clauses on them um that was a result from an acquisition that went a little bad uh years ago but my employees did have non-competes so that made it better um you know we had reviewed financial statements so there was you know a trust factor in with that our equipment was up to date you know we had a modern fleet of trucks at that time that were just superior i mean we could uh we grow mark's a great company don't get me wrong but uh we smoked them on how we did things versus how they <laughs> were doing things. So that, that that kind of is a perfect lead into. So you said you sold to eight companies, right? So you keep saying Growmark, but and you told me some of the story. So I'm kind of curious, like yeah. for what 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 was the structure? How did that work? Um, and then what were they buying? And how did they like how did they distribute your company to a bunch of different uh, sections? So Growmark is a cooperative, a farm cooperative, and they have what's called member companies. So they have they have an FS. FS brand, so you have a Madison service company and a Clinton County uh, service company. So we was able to, because we had an up-to-date computer system, uh, they they have territories which go by counties. Uh, so we was able to split our gross profit by zip code, mm. which is how they then determine the allocation of the purchase price to, you know, their fs member companies and then Growmark kept the lubricant side so uh you know it's because we had a good sound accounting procedures in place that also made it pretty simple to divvy it up i was to say for you to you obviously had your stuff squeaky clean to be able to do something that complicated in six weeks <laughs> yeah it was it was amazing it wasn't easy i feel like, and we did it mostly at night it was, it was that's what was crazy about it it was like i'd get home and and um you know, get on the phone and be on the phone for four hours, but then I could run up to the office. I live close to the office and print off reports that they needed, and and uh, it actually went very smooth. So when and how did you tell your employees? <laughs> um, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, interesting part of every acquisition. So I've been on both sides of the table. You walk in, you got these blank stares looking at you, you know. Uh, <laughs> I had a meeting with my operations managers on a monthly basis, and uh, that day – we um, 
we was scheduled to have our normal operations meeting and I had met with Grill Mark in the morning. They left the place where we have our meeting. My employee, my operations managers came in and uh, they're looking a little f- confused because my wife was there and she's usually not there. There wasn't no paperwork for them to look at and, you know. Uh, told just them, a gut feeling, right? Like, yeah, oh, like, here it is. Something's up, you know. <laughs> and uh, told them we sold the company, and and it's kind of funny selling it to Growmark and FS. I mean, they're they're our largest competitor out there, and it's like you know they disbelief, but you know the fortunate thing was when we did the negotiations, I was at first set out that my management team got a job, and as it worked out, every employee. Um, got offered a position and with the exception of one they all got had a job at the end of the day and the one that didn't have a job at the end of the day was his own fault so he kind of overthought the situation and said some things that he shouldn't have and it was his fault so i didn't have to feel bad about that well and, but and they were shocked and after that we actually gathered all the employees up at a local convention center and uh in each of the, it was actually nine companies so they're we, we talked to all of them at one time, and then we went into separate room, another room where we had a table for every company and, and told employees where they'd be going, and then they went to that table and talked to whoever was there to represent that company. And, and I think, you know, you handled it a uh, fantastic way, and I think, you know, even at the conference we were at last week, you know, there's this big question mark of how do you handle this because, I, you know, I don't know how you ran your company, but just knowing you, I believe you're probably just as transparent as the best entrepreneur wants to be where, you know, you're, you're trying to give everybody as much freedom and autonomy to grow as individuals as you want to. But then all of a sudden you get into this weird, goofy place. And I dealt with the same thing where all of a sudden you're kind of feel like you're sneaking around and <laughs> like, when do you tell them and what's good and what's not? And, um, I don't know what you've seen, uh, with the acquisitions you've, you've done and also what you're doing now where there's just only so much you can do before the deal is done because like you we were saying before we started the recording is that the deal is not done till the money's in the bank so it, at what point is there's no justice in telling them because it just screws everybody's heads up because you don't know if the deal is going to happen yeah um yeah you know every situation is different you know after last year in october 15 we purchased a property management company and we didn't tell any of the employees until the day it happened you know until after you know, we had signed the contract, the money had taken place, and um, we had a glass of bubbly, and then we went back to the office, and she called them all into the conference room, and that was 17 employees, and, you know, we told them we had purchased the company that morning, and in that situation, everything went fine also. Mm-hmm. You know, while we was at the conference, uh, I was I told the crowd, I think, if you remember, yep. you know, about a company that I'm working with currently, and... Uh, they did a good job in that they had two employees that can run the company, but there was no non-compete. There was no golden handcuffs, and uh, they told them this past weekend that the company was being sold in a week. And what was really shaky about that is the sales contingent on those two employees staying with the company. If they Oof. walked, the deal's off. Oh. You know, so fortunately it, it went well. And then I think the next day they told the rest of the employees. But yeah, I mean it. You know, it just all depends on your situation. How many employees do you have? How many key employees do you have? You know, what's your industry like that, you know, they could walk across the street tomorrow? I mean, that's why I had no competes on my employees because way back in 1995, I had a situation where we bought a company. Um, it was only two employees. Um, it was uh, uh, the one employee – ran the one company uh it was it was 30 miles away from where the home base was but i always thought that guy was the nicest guy in the world you know everybody liked him and uh the owner called me and said asked me if it was on a saturday morning i'll never forget it said you want to buy my place over there in highland and it's like sure i mean that guy's the nicest guy in the world i'm getting along with him because i asked him i said why are you selling this because because of him and i'm like well must be something wrong with you well (laughs) we bought it and guess what there's nothing wrong with him that guy was like (laughs) bipolar it's like holy cow and uh he left and he made it with us one year and he left and went to a competitor and took a bunch of customers with him you know and ran our name in the mud doing it so just a fox in sheep's clothing huh (laughs) Yeah, it was. Wow. So, I mean, just some advice the way we did it is uh, we had a a non-compete in our employee manual, and they had to sign off 
at the same time that they read the employee manual, they signed a non-compete. So uh, after that, it's just tricky getting that non-compete when they're already an employee and you didn't do it on the front end. Yep, yep. So as you sold, how like what were the terms? Did you have to work there? And uh, what what did life after business for the first? Because you've got an interesting couple of stepping mm-hmm. stones to get you to where you are today. So kind of walk us through that journey. Yeah. So I, I had to work with them for six months. And um, I agreed to work for half of my salary for that six months, which I wouldn't do that again. <laughs> that I didn't want to be wrapped up into a long-term contract because what if I didn't like it? So the way we worked it out, uh, there were some last-minute negotiations that led me to getting half my salary. So at the end of the six months, they could either keep me or or we could part ways. And um, it was kind of funny because when they originally came to me, they said, we're interested in buying your company and you because we don't understand how you could be so efficient at the way you're doing <laughs> things. So at the end of the six months, I'm like, eh, they ain't going to keep me. I know it's just they're in, in an older company. They have their ways. And I think at the end of the day, they said, yep, we see how you do it. But, yeah, we're just going to keep doing it our way. So <laughs> so we was done. It was an amicable split. It was fine because, you know, my employees that went to there are still all coming back to me about things. And it, it was just – it was part of the reason for selling the company anyway is it was time for me to, you know, climb the next hill. So mm-hmm. – so – you know, from the day you sold it, even though, uh, I mean, it's just crazy. It is one thing, and I talk about it in the book, that I didn't do, and that's why the last book, chapter of my book is called Don't Be Like the Dog That Caught the Car. Know what the heck you're going to do with your life. I mean, I went from answering 100 phone calls a day to looking at my phone wondering if the thing still worked. Had no idea what I was going to do with myself. Uh, I was watching – the Today Show in the morning, the Price is Right at noon, and Oprah in the afternoon, and bugging the wife, and she's like, you need to get a job. <laughs> so our house is apparently a uh, marital asset that I'm not allowed to be at during the day. <laughs> so another piece of advice I would tell people, my wife worked for me, and when we was talking about selling the company, I told her, you know, if we sell the company – you won't have to have a job anymore. And she took that to heart, and she still doesn't have a job. <laughs> I'm really interested in getting one. <laughs> Careful what you say. So, yeah, no kidding. But, uh, you know, y- y- you start picking the pieces back up, and, you know, it was a good thing selling the company, but it um, about three months in after, you know, I had left altogether, uh, a, a bank called me, a big bank, 20,000 employees, and wanted me to do commercial lending, and, and uh, it's like, you know what? They offered me a very fair salary, four weeks vacation. It's like, well, why not? I feel like I've been doing banking for 20 years, just, you know, on the other side of the fence. So, uh, like I said, when I started there, it, w- it was it was good. There was structure. I didn't have to make hard decisions, uh, didn't have any credit authority. So, if they didn't approve something. It's like, well, sorry, I can tell you how to improve things, but, you know, it's not my hard decision mm-hmm. to do that. Um but then, you know, after a while, your entrepreneurial itch comes back, and and uh, big banks don't like to do things outside of the box. And, you know, I think most entrepreneurs kind of run on a wing and a prayer. Uh, so, but it, it, it took a while. And, I mean, I would tell you in some aspects today, it's like, wow, you're still trying to figure out what do I really want to be when I grow up. What was it like? I mean, so I, I can kind of relate where all of a sudden you just don't have to have the, your, the buck doesn't stop at you. And that must have been kind of nice when you're at the commercial bank for a little while. But what did that feel like? I mean, because you were there for three years, right? I mean, that's that's a significant chunk of time to I mean, uh, did you have a quota for loans? I mean, what was that like working, well, I- working for a 20,000 person company? Yeah. So, I mean, ultimately you did have, they called it a scorecard and, and, you know, really what the, the straw that broke the camel's back, it's just funny the way, you know, big companies work is, yeah, you had a scorecard. So if you didn't get a score, meet your scorecard, you didn't meet your bonus, but you know, you don't have a lot of control over it because you can bring deals to the plate, but if the bank doesn't approve them or if their fees are too high, I mean, banking so competitive, you, you know, uh, you know what are you going to do? So, but they changed their policy that if you didn't meet your scorecard, then you was going to get written up. You didn't meet your scorecard <laughs> twice, and you got fired. It's like, well, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. So that's what uh, I, 
you know, that's what led me, you know, away no kidding. From there was just <laughs> stuff like that it was silly. Well, I mean, and, you, you, I mean, just on the outset, first of all, knowing you, then you got a you got an entrepreneur that sold a forty two million dollar business who's getting written up if he doesn't get a scorecard filled. Right. I mean, that just, I mean, whoever your boss would was must have just almost himself thought it was ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, and he didn't have no control over it. You know, I mean, that, it, decisions were coming from way above him. So, uh, you, you know, I, I think, you know, when you're going through that, you know, you start reflecting and it's like, what did I really enjoy? And, and, and I enjoyed mergers and acquisitions. I, you know, running the company, uh, you had a gentleman on that I list a, a podcast that you did. You know, he's like, that's the boring part, running the company. I want to be doing something fun. And fun for me was going and buying another company or building a bulk plant. So uh, locally, there's no full service I don't like to call it a business brokerage, but an M&A company in the area. Uh, I went and got my CVA designation to add some legitimacy to valuing companies. Um, so today, so we started that company uh, and now do, you know, help people with mergers and acquisitions. I work with companies between one and that have a value of between one and 15 million, do business valuations and help people with, you know, it's a dirty word to call it exit planning, but, you know, help people build value in their company and i think the value builder system is a great way to do it uh and I'm, I'm enjoying it i mean it's it's fun i really do enjoy it and i really feel like you know because of our real life world experiences you know you can sit down and talk to an owner or, or somebody was wanting to buy at a company and and you know talk about customer concentration and I'll tell you why customer concentration is important because I bought a company and when the mine closed I lost a ton of the lubes business that I thought <laughs> I had and it was only two years into the purchase of the company you know you can give them real life examples you know of uh, of, of things uh, that of happen stuff that you've been through and I think that's why I'm writing the book you know uh, so tell us just, about the book so it's always been kind of a bucket list thing to write a book and um uh, uh, I started on it last January, and I mean, I, I know I was always a numbers guy, so why I'm writing a book is kind of silly, but <laughs> as far as my, my grammar and English skills go, but I used a coach, <laughs> and that's working out great, and uh, basically, you know, she walks you through it step by step, but I, but the book is about buying and selling companies, so I start off from kind of the buyer's perspective on why would you buy an existing company you know why would you maybe want to look at a franchise what's the risk in starting a company from scratch you know who started innovative from scratch and that's it's a tough road to hoe when your first day you don't have a single customer you know then we get into how do you value a company and uh you know what's the process of buying a company from how do you approach the owner and what leads you to the loi and uh then um we kind of get into there's a chapter each about uh, after about your financial statements and then there's a chapter about bankers and attorneys and financial advisors and you know I intermingle stories of my experiences with them and then and then we kind of get to you know now you've built it what do you do with it or how do you build the intrinsic value you know a lot of things you talk mm -hmm. about in the value builder system it's funny I wrote a chapter before it got the value builder system uh, but you know recurring revenue non-competes things like that uh then the process of selling the business who do you talk to first get your team in place you know uh do you need a broker you're gonna sell it to a family member how are you gonna structure the deal uh and then the last chapter like i said is don't be like a dog that caught the car you know have some thought around what the heck you're gonna do in your next life well, because it's it, it's so important, is and I mean, like I actually called it phantom anxiety. You talked about like a hundred emails, hundred phone calls, and you just kind of feel like you just like it's almost like the ghost emails. Like you you feel like you should be getting them, but you're not, and you're completely <laughs> irrelevant. <laughs> it is funny, uh, but you know, so uh, it is. It's definitely an experience to go through. Um, What's the name uh, of the book called? Know, so I told you I'm using the co a coaching process and not 100% what the name of the book is, but a recurring theme throughout the book is you don't know what you don't know. Uh, so that might be the, the title of it if it's available. Uh, and it, I really like that. I mean, there's just so many things. If I could go back, you know, f with what I know now, if I'd have known that back then, oh my gosh, it could have been dangerous with certain things you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. isn't that crazy uh, no, I, I agree it's uh one of our uh advisors he calls it 
unconsciously incompetent. <laughs> so <laughs> if we can just raise ourselves to be consciously incompetent, like it changes the whole dynamic. <laughs> yep. It well, is. It's crazy. So, well, if there's one thing, uh, one word of advice that you'd be giving our listeners that we haven't talked about, you, you talked and we touched on a lot of different stuff, but if it's one thing you'd leave them with, what would it be? If they're a business owner, talk to somebody. I mean, plan ahead. I mean, that, I, that's where I talk about in the book of things I think I did right and things I did wrong. I didn't talk to anybody. I didn't talk to a financial advisor. I didn't talk to my accountant until way down the road with having this thing lined out. But, you know, put that team in place. Talk to your accountant. Talk to your you know, attorney, uh, have a financial advisor, you know, a good financial advisor that, uh, is experienced in managing assets. Hope, you know, hopefully you're getting over a million dollars. That's good. That there's a difference between a financial advisor that manages over a million dollars and ones that manage $80,000. Uh, I think you would agree with that, you know, have, but you, you know, one thing I leave is have your team in place. Mm-hmm. I would agree. And, and a team, and if I can just extend on that is having a team that drops their ego and collaborates you know it's it, your goal the owner's goal is the important goal not anybody else's yeah and because i mean here's here's another true story i mean you're w- w- for me selling my company there's a lot of people that made a lot of money off my company <laughs> right. and with you selling it there was a lot of people that were very unhappy with me selling it you mm-hmm. know uh without naming suppliers or professionals or whatever i can just tell a funny story was you know which our headquarters was still in that town of 600 people nobody knew how big of a company we was because for the most part you know we had things scattered all over the place but the way it works in illinois that little town of 600 people benefited from our sales tax revenue immensely and when we closed doors they lost a huge chunk of revenue because we was no longer there so i mean those are you know your suppliers out you know if you're paying your cpa a lot of money for reviewed statements he just lost a client Mm -hmm. you know fuel supplier lost a client the lubricants people that you know Gromark had their own blending facility so um it it stokes up a lot of emotion when you're doing something like that i mean beyond the employees yeah it's quite the journey and and i we i appreciate you so much sharing all the all the wise wisdom and the gold nuggets here i mean you've got a huge huge um depth of knowledge and and i appreciate you sharing it with us terry uh what's the way the best way for our listeners to get in touch with you Probably cell phone and email. Uh, my cell phone number is 618-530-8922, and my email address is terry, T-E-R-R-Y, at Innovative, and Innovative has two ends, innovativeBaboyApple.com. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it.